can talk freely about other things, but when it gets to that, there's something there. That, because there, there's something going on. There's a spiritual thing going on here. So how are we going to do that? You know, we answer those questions. What are we going to do? What's our next step? Well, that's what this series is about. That's why we're doing Who's Your One? And I hope that question just comes back to you every day. I hope it just kind of rattles around in your head and bounces back and forth and that the answer begins to come. Now, I want you to, I hope, I hope we take the opportunity and the challenge to build a non-manipulative relationship, a genuine relationship, a safe place with fun um, elements in that and somebody you enjoy, somebody enjoys you or somebody that you care about with somebody uh, and have uh, spiritual conversations with them during the weeks to come. We certainly don't need another method of evangelism. So for those of you who kind of feel a little intimidated and you're thinking, oh man, I remember we used to do this at my church or he's going to show us how to do this and it's going to be one of those things. You know what? It's, this is not that. This is not what that's about. I think we've got enough methods of evangelism. I've been through... I, I don't know, a dozen of those. What we do need, what we need, Calvary, I'm talking to you, I'm talking to me, what we need is a passion. We don't need to be told how to do it yet again. I think we just need a passion to do it, to see people that we know, people that we care about. Uh, and it, it may be an acquaintance of yours that God just, you know, Holy Spirit just starts putting on your mind and you just can't shake that. It could be one of your best friends. It could be a roommate. It could be somebody you do business with. Uh, I think the Lord is going to begin uh, to, to see, you know, let that face it begin to emerge and that name uh, just begin to stick with you. Because these are people we know about, people we care about, that we want to see have this relationship that we have uh, for them to experience a new life through Jesus. I've told you countless times that I had some friends, particularly one guy in particular, uh, who took an interest in me, and he didn't just care about me. He would loan me money when I was broke. He would come get me if my car broke down. I mean, he expressed the fact that he cared about me in a lot of ways. And later, after the fact, after we began having these conversations, you know, I asked him, I said, what made you take the risk, you know, that I might start distancing myself from you or push back a little bit when you began to talk about Jesus because it took me a little bit off guard, but I was curious and I was asking questions. And he said, well, how can I do all this other stuff? How can I say, I'm your friend and I'm going to be there for you? I mean, we had been, and I, I don't want to talk about it too much, we'd been in fights together, not like with each other, but with other people, like big fights where there was a lot of people fighting a lot of people and because I'm a redneck from North Memphis and and we had done, I mean, we'd just been through all kinds of things together. We'd been in trouble together. We had done some things I don't want to talk about together. I'm not real proud of that. And things, and good things together. We'd been through school and all of these events. He said, how can we do all that? And then when we get to Jesus, I just shut down. I go, nope. Rather let you just go on your way without him. If that's the best thing that ever happened to me, if he is the sweetest thing that's ever happened in my life and the relationship that I just cherish more than everything else, but no, nah, I don't want you to know about it. He said, it just didn't make sense to me. And that's what this series is all about, for us stepping across that line. Now, I've already told you and promised you this is not uh, an elaborate, uh, complicated, or manipulative idea. It's very simple. You know, the word Christian only appears in the New Testament three times. But we hear it a lot. I mean, you see it on social media. You hear it in the news. There's these assumptions of people who think, I thought I knew. I had these ideas about who Christians were. Uh, and I thought they were kind of quirky, kind of goofy in some ways. And there are other things I respected about them. And, you know, and, and there are different ideas. And when you say Christian, everybody's going to have an idea what that means to them. Because they were brought up maybe in a non-Christian home or a Catholic home or a Baptist home. Or anyway, there's going to be some kind of stereotype in their mind that that comes about. In my home, where I was raised and grew up, Christian was like a cultural thing. Well, of course you're a Christian. <laughs> I mean, everybody's Christian, you know. But it only came out at funerals and weddings. 
we really just kind of kept it over to the side other way in an everyday life. And so I, I was very disconnected from the idea. And of course, just saying, well, yeah, we're Christians. It was just more of this, it was this it's really a, a, a hard thing to understand or to even wrap my mind around or think about. Most folks have an opinion. Most folks have an idea what that means. And it could be right or it could be wrong about what it means to be Christian. And you're going to have to push past that a little bit. And it's even tougher for me when I have these conversations because a lot of people, my neighbors, uh, people that I interact with, they know I'm a pastor. So, you know, they're kind of on guard a little bit. They're waiting for it because they know that's my job. You know, I'm like a professional Christian. I'm not just Christian amateur. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm like get paid to be a Christian. So the, 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 they kind of see it coming. So when I mention that, they go, and there it is. I knew it. I knew you'd eventually work this conversation back to what your thing is. And I think, no. And so I have to push past that. And I have to let folks know, no, I'm being genuine. I'm going to be your friend. I'm not trying to push you toward this conclusion or to kind of box you in so that you say a magic prayer or you do something and I get credit for it or, you know, I get a bonus at the end of the year in heaven or whatever happens. It just doesn't work like that. So you're going to have to kind of be aware that, you know, and maybe your friends already know you're a Christian and so they've already got an idea. Maybe they kid you a little bit. I used to tease my Christian friends and kind of make fun of them for some of the things I thought they did was a little weird. And then later I understood. And then I had friends and still do who are not Christian who kind of make fun of me and, and make jokes about that and everything. And I, I get it. I get it. That's okay. But you know what? Holy Spirit is so much stronger than our culture. So don't worry about that. Don't get tangled up in that and let that be the thing that pulls you back and keeps you in the shadows. It's just simple. J.D. Greer is a pastor of the Summit Church in Raleigh, Durham. It's a huge church. He's a great guy. He's in North Carolina. He's the author of several books. You've probably heard of him. He also happens to be the president of our denomination. His church did a very similar series uh, last year, kind of the forerunner. And there's going to be some other churches. We're the first one that I know about in Knoxville in this area doing this kind of a series. But there's going to be some other churches do something similar. Well, he, he was kind of the prototype. They, they did this series, and they had a lot of people to come to know Christ. And he said it was just beautiful, and he, said he just loved doing that. Um, but he said one of his favorite moments was that he uh, overheard this young woman in his church, a college-age lady in his church, and she was there for one of the baptisms uh, during their worship service. And she looked up and she saw this other young lady in, in the baptistry. And their, their baptistry is a little different than ours, but that she was there. And she said, oh, that's her. And her friends thought, like, that's her who? And she goes, that's my one. She's my one. And said she just began to cry because her friend through all these connections and links, and you may be in the beginning of a conversation, you may be the middle of a conversation. I remember, I remember being in the kitchen of someone who started talking about Jesus, and it was at the end of a weekend where like four people had started talking about this. I'll never forget walking out on the front porch of my friend's house, and I'm standing there, he goes, what? He came out and said, what's, you know, like, what's going on? I said, has everybody become a Christian? Those were my words. Like I was annoyed, like I was mad about it. I said, what is, you know, the deal? What is going on? Has everybody become a Christian? What, I, you know, because the Lord just kept bringing these people by my path and just real gently speaking into my life. And they weren't obnoxious. They weren't forceful. They weren't twisting my arm. They weren't going, you know what, you better. They weren't judgmental. Uh, in fact, the last person, I had gotten cut, yet another fight, and uh, was, if you go to the hospital, they report stuff like that. So we, we go, you remember, like John Gaston, okay. He remembers the emergency room in Memphis. But so we went to her house because she's a nurse. And we're sitting in the kitchen and sitting in this chair. And she's, she's, you know, fixing this and everything. And she said, they called me Danny back then. And they said, Danny, she said, I can pat you up on the outside. I can fix this. But there's what you need. The only what you need is to be fixed on the inside. You need to be complete on the inside. And I can't do that. There's only one that can do that, and that's Jesus. I'll never forget that. And I'm sitting there going, 
shut up. Why, why is everybody talking about this? Because uh, seriously, four different people had had this conversation. But that kept leading me into a deeper curiosity. And it wasn't that night, but it wasn't very many nights later that I began, renewed, refreshed this relationship. Uh, I wish it had been sooner. So we're not presenting to our friends, our coworkers, our classmates, our teammates, our neighbors, all these people, uh, this one with a formula. We don't have a formula. Okay, we're not going to reduce the love of Jesus and the grace of God to a formula or a system of religion. In fact, probably you may have to break past a system of religion that's already there, that's already locked in, and this idea that people have. You know, I was talking to a friend of mine, and I was saying, man, you know, blah, 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 and I finally got to the Lord and goes, oh, I'm a Christian. I go, What? Oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. And it was just it was just this label. And there's this terrible misunderstanding. It was true in my life. It's true in a lot of people's lives. Some of you, you may be card-carrying members of the Calvary Baptist Church, but as lost as a ball in tall grass. And only you know that. And you know there's not this real communication or connection with Jesus. It's just a religion. It's just a system. It's just something that's a part of your life, like a club. It's more than that. Now, we're going to look at a passage today that will be a little unusual as far as addressing this specific issue. But I want to make sure that we are in him and that we understand that one point is that I'm not talking about religion. I'm not trying to get you to go out and be salespeople and we've got a quota we're going to meet and all that. No, I'm going to ask you to have one conversation out of your heart with another person. But it's got to be real for you, right? You've got to understand what we're talking about. Now, I came in so quickly from the Chinese church that I grabbed the wrong Bible. So this is going to be a little different version than you may not can see the screen anyway, so it's irrelevant. You think, Dan, we can't see those. Um, so I'm just going to read to you out of Matthew chapter 9. Kind of a familiar scripture for some of us, but may be new to others. Uh, in the 16th verse, Jesus uses this word picture. He's so brilliant at metaphors, and just I, I just think, oh, I get the idea. I just get it uh, because of the way he talks. Um, so the disciples, are, let me give you a little backstory here. The disciples of John the Baptist came to Jesus. They were in the John the Baptist Club, and they came to Jesus and said, why don't your disciples fast? Because the Pharisees do, and we've been doing that. You see, they're locked into a system of religion with a lot of do's and don'ts and rules and guidelines and things. And they're thinking, we're all playing by the rules. Your guys are just, they don't do anything. They're not living like that at all. How come? How come? So Jesus begins to explain that. And first of all, he says, well, this is like wedding guests. And I'm, you know, the bride. And he, he paints this picture. And then he says this. He gets to it in verse 16. Besides... Who would patch old clothing with new cloth? For the new patch would shrink and rip away from the old cloth, leaving an even bigger tear than before. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. For the old skins would burst from the pressure, spilling the wine and ruining the skins. New wine is stored in new wineskins so that both are preserved. And I don't know if they scratched their head a little bit, but, you know, right after this, a leader of the synagogue uh, came rushing in, and the whole context changed. He said, you know, my daughter's just died, and I need your attention. So they kind of, they left the subject for that moment. But Jesus said a big, important thing there. And what I want you to get, what I want to know, and what I want our friends that we began to talk about know, is that we're not offering some patched up old version of Old Testament laws. Uh, I'm not trying to be somebody better. I'm not trying, you know, my grandmother, God bless her, she lived to be 93. I loved her, and she was a faithful follower of Jesus, but she always connected that to church, church, church. And when she would have spiritual conversation with me, you know what she would say? I wish you'd get started back in church. I wish you'd go to church. Listen, going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than walking in the McDonald's makes you a hamburger. 
that is not what changes us. And I understood. And maybe she's thinking, if I could just get him in a Christian environment, if I could get him around other believers, he would go, oh, he's got a tender heart, he's a sensitive, then maybe he would get it. But it was almost, to my ears, as if the end result, it was like the goal was to be sitting in this room on Sunday mornings in worship. I think everybody would have been happy if I just did that. That was, you know, the bottom line. That was the definition. We're not about that, and that's not what Jesus was talking about. He said, this isn't just a patched up version of what we've been doing, not trying to make an improved you. We're offering the gospel. We're offering something new and powerful and beautiful. It's grace. It's new life in Christ. So Jesus has this word picture, and he speaks of old garments and old wineskins. And it's a word that specifically means, when he talks about old, he says it's something that's worn out. You just can't use it anymore. You know, it's just, it's become obsolete. My first computer was a, uh, a, a Mac Classic. It was a kind of a off-white box about this big with a little screen, had 486, not gigs, K. <laughs> I mean, it, and I thought, what will I do with all that space? And some of you, you know, you're reminiscing, and you're thinking, I remember that. And I had a Bible program I put in it, and all I could do was read the Bible. But I would, I would fire this thing up, and I think it had a wooden crank on the side. No, but it, it, was, it was clunky and slow, but to us, it was just like amazing. And I think I can just pick up my Bible and read it, but oh no, I needed to use my computer to read my Bible because I had it there, you know. It just, it, there was no internet, there was no connection. Now you would laugh at it. I mean, it would be kind of cool to have sitting around in your house, and people would come in and go, ah, you know, it's like a conversation piece. But you don't want to use it every day, trust me. Do you remember dial-up? Do you remember getting to the hotel or in your home and going, you know, and trying to get this incredibly slow connection? I mean, it was just, and then it could be, it could disappear any moment. You don't want to go back to that. Why? Because it's obsolete. You've got more power in your pocket than it took NASA to put a man on the moon. I mean, you don't want to go backwards. That would be obsolete. The only phone we had, you know, I'm just so dating myself, we had this big plastic phone, it was about this big, on the kitchen wall. And that was it, if you wanted to call somebody, first you had to wait for somebody to get off the party line. You know, you had to wait for that to, you know, go and you get your chance, and then you call somebody, and you had to stand there in the kitchen with your parents right there listening, pretending like they're not listening, they're listening, and you know, they know and everything. So, you know, that, that was it. And now that's no big deal. That's no big deal. There was nothing wrong with that. It's just obsolete. You know, one time when people came to Tennessee and then they kept pushing westward, this is how they got there. And you may not be able to see this real well because of the, the glare today. Uh, but they used these covered wagons. And it's, it's, you just got to imagine, picture one in your heart if, you, if it's not going to come up there. Um, so they would go across on covered wagons. Nothing wrong, nothing immoral, nothing sinful, nothing bad about a, it's, it's just not going to happen, uh, a, a covered wagon. But it just became obsolete. I came in late. I was probably one of the last cars to come in worship today, parked right out in front. There was not one horse in our parking lot. I love horses. I don't want to offend those of you who are horse people, but you know what? Just as far as a mode of daily transportation, horses and wagons and buggies, they're just obsolete. It's just not the way we roll now. <laughs> See what I did? <laughs> this is more, this, you'd rather have something like, no, you, you, you're still not going to see it, uh, uh, but a, a, a 2020 uh, Bentley GT, Continental GT. That's what I put a picture of, because I just, I just put... What is the most busting, luxurious, expensive car I could buy right now? And that's what kept coming up. And I looked at it and thought, oh, my goodness, you know, I could rebuy my house for cheaper than I could buy one of those, you know. Because that's what you'd rather have. So you get the idea. And that's what this word old means. And Jesus says, that's just old. It's worn out. 
And he mentions garments, and some of you have clothes. Some of you guys have sweaters, or you've got your favorite pair of jeans, and you're so reluctant to give them up. And you just don't want to let go of them. But at some point, you'll have to because they'll become obsolete. Okay, so you've got the idea. That's what Jesus is talking about. It's the same word that Paul uses in Ephesians 4, 22, when he speaks of our old selves. He says this. In verse 22, he says, Put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in the true and true righteousness and holiness. So he says, that was old, this is new. Then Jesus talks about new wine. He, the, the word for new is, means, because they had like different words for new, and we kind of do, even though we use the same word, we understand because of the context of our conversations what we're talking about. You know, um, if somebody says, oh, yeah, he's got a new girlfriend. You don't expect to see like an alien, you know, or, you know, oh, he's dating a tree now. That was just totally different. No, you expect that it'll be a girl, the same kind, you know, the same thing, but it's a newer version or a new edition. That's, and some of you laugh because that's what you do. But, um, uh, you kind of get the idea. It's the same thing, but it's a newer one. You know, it's a new car, but it's still a car. It's just a newer kind of car. So that's what one of these words means. This word is not that word. This word means new, something that didn't exist before. Not an improved version, not a remake, not something restored. It's something fresh. Something, it's the same thing that Peter was talking about in 2 Peter 1 4 when he said, And now, you know, before we were religious and we tried keeping the rules and we followed everything and we did that. He goes, Oh, but now, he said, We're partakers of the divine nature. He said, Now we're not just trying to live for God, we're not just watching Him, we're not just serving Him, He's in us. We have taken Him in us and we are in Him something new, something different uh, had happened. Now, there's nothing wrong with traveling by a covered wagon. However, there's, you know, probably not a good, it's not going to be convenient. It's not going to work because we have something new and, and it's much better. Some folks are still trying to fix up their old wagon self. And just make it better. Some of us are trying to feed our old horse self. And just make it stronger. And you try. And you try. And we're just mimicking that. And Jesus said, the reason, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. How is that working for you? He said, when you put new wine into old wineskins... You're only going to cause those bags to expand as it ferments, and it's just going to rip and tear, and it's going to burst it apart. You probably don't have, like, wineskins hanging around your house, but you've seen that with other containers, right? You leave something out in the sun or something expands, and, and it bur you know, even you've done it on purpose with, you know, two-liter Coke bottles to make them spew out. So you've got the idea. The word that he uses is, is a word called shizma. And I know that's impressive, but it's, I, I only mention it because it's the word we get our word schism from, or in Great Britain, schism from. You understand? It's when something is torn. Off, often it means violently or quickly. It's kind of like a band-aid. You can either just pull it off, or you can go, okay, one, two, three, rip, you know, and just rip it off. That's this word. Jesus said, you know, it's something that's pulled apart into pieces. And when you, here, here's the thing, when you combine grace with anything else, it creates a schism in you. It begins to tear. And that's why, 
That's why some of you are confused or you're defeated or you're overwhelmed. You're trying to fit the new wine of the new covenant into the old wineskins of the old covenant. And it's continually just so frustrating. And we get torn. We get torn. And sometimes when I'm in spiritual conversations with people, what they want to talk about is everything they've heard and everything they've grown up with. And even my, my own family have, have done this. They go, well, you, you know, you're a Christian, so let me tell me about this. And they'll go off on outer, things about outer space suddenly become so important. You know? It's like, well, if God can do, you know, and these, these stories like, you know, that are just fantastic or ridiculous, you know, and kind of nonsensical. And all that, you know, that's just a buffer. That's just to keep things at a distance. And some of that grows up. And we feel this tendency. And one of the fears we have and reasons that we don't talk about this is we're so afraid one of our friends is going to ask a question that we can't answer or make a statement that we can't give a rebuttal to. And so, you know, I had a friend, and he, he said he was, he was all about evolution, and he said, well, Dan, you're a Christian, but let me tell you this about the earth and the age of the earth and scientists. He kept pulling I said, you know what? Can we talk about that in the next conversation today? Let's just talk about Jesus. Let me tell you what Jesus has done for me and what he wants to do for you. And he told me later, he said, you just kept bringing it back to Jesus as he would divert and distract and try to talk about other things. Your friends and your your folks you you talk to, they'll do the same thing. So you can try to do that. If you're a good apologist, go for it. But uh, for me, you know what? I'm just going to keep bringing it back to Jesus and we'll have those conversations later. We're offering genuine peace and grace through him. And in order for us to do that, we have to know it ourselves. It has to be a part of us. Not that you have to have everything figured out, you know, and you think, well, I'm not going to talk to anybody because I haven't even read the whole Bible yet, or I don't know that I haven't been to anything, and I don't know. You know what? That's all right. First disciples, I mean, look at those guys, look at those women. They, you know, they were just going forward in this stumbling, bumbling way, but it caught momentum and they turned the whole world upside down. Because it's what you it's what you have, it's who you are now. It's not everything you know. You don't have to get your act together. You don't it's not that. Just talk out of your heart. Because he has your heart and you have all of his. That's something you can talk about. That's something you can talk about. Most of you, when you got married or you entered into a date, or dating relationship, you didn't tell somebody, look, I'm falling in love with you and I'm so crazy about you and I am going to study marriage and relationships for two years and then I'm going to come back and maybe we can begin to go out. Now, they didn't do that, did they? They said, hey, what are you doing Friday night? <laughs> That's this. That, this, is, this is the way. You know, in... in In verse 17, he says, when we follow Jesus and we allow him to flow his identity, his new identity through our new identity, he says, when that happens, we will be preserved. And that got my attention because I thought, preserved? That doesn't sound really exciting. You know, I remember my, you know, family making preserves and uh, it was good, but I don't know what I'm going to get. Is that what's going to happen? So, that, so I looked it up. Because so that kind of got me interested in thinking, what, is, what does that mean? And it means that word has all wrapped around it the idea of being kept safe, of being guarded by the Holy Spirit, that he's close by. It, it's the word, you know, in, in Luke 2.19, because we just did this, right? We're just coming out of Christmas and one of the most famous passages, it says, and lo, lo um, there were shepherds, you know, abiding in their fields, keeping watch over their sheep by night. That little word, keeping watch, is this same word. It's just one word. And it means to guard, to look out for, to surround, to protect. They were giving this attention and care. That's what Jesus does in us. The word preserve originally meant to present something that's still intact. 
it's not been fractured or broken or shattered. You know, that it's still together. It's, it's been remade. And most of you know, and I've mentioned it, I've got an old car. I've got a 57 Chevrolet, and I've spent the last 28 years trying to restore it. Without money or time, it's a very difficult process. <laughs> you know, it's just hard to do. But, you know, it's the same car it was. It's just gradually being restored. I guess that's a little bit of a metaphor of the Christian life, but this means something different. It means just an instant. It's like you're new. You're, you're, you've been made new in a fresh way. You're not just, you know, in, when you're in Christ, and I really want you to get this, you are not broken anymore. He did not patch you up. He did not glue you together. And there's still the cracks, and there's still the frays, and there's still the worn places. You're not broken anymore. Some of us need to go home, look in the mirror, and evangelize yourself. You need to be the first you that you talk to. You need to be your one. Because <laughs> you kind of get it, kind of believe it, and kind of not. I had lunch with a friend this week, and he said, I'm going to tell you to do something. And he said, and just try this. And he said, you're going to feel really silly. I go, I felt silly many times in my life doing things I've done. And he said, okay, when nobody's around, stand in front of your bathroom mirror. You got a bathroom mirror? I go, yeah, I got a big old bathroom mirror. He goes, okay. Uh, he said, stand in front of it. Go into the Superman pose. You know what that, you know, like that? I actually kind of resemble him when I go into this pose. A lot of, uh, you go into Superman pose. He said, and look in the mirror. And he said, just begin to speak things you know you're true that the Holy Spirit's given you. I said, do I have to do the pose? Because my family already catches me talking to the dog. They talk, you know, they catch. And they, they're just thinking, that they're, they're starting to have comments like, Dan, do you fit? Tell me about what you're thinking, you know. And I said, so I, I don't want to enhance that by being in front of the mirror in Superman pose. And I said, he said, no, just, just do that. Now, I don't, I'm not recommending you do that. But I am saying you need to tell yourself the truth. I do want you to go home, evangelize yourself, look in front of the mirror, and say out loud probably at least every day for a month. Close your door so your roommates don't see you or, you know, go to the guest bathroom so your mom doesn't think, honey, can we talk? You know, <laughs> who else is in here? I heard you talking. Nobody, mom. Okay. Uh, it, it's okay. But I want you to look in the mirror and every day for a month, I want you to say something like this, whatever fits you. I am not broken. I am not fractured. I am not shattered. I'm not just patched up. I am not glued together. I am not damaged goods. I am not tarnished. I am new. I am in Christ. I am guarded. I am kept safe. I am not alone. I am loved. I am cherished. I belong to the king. I am his daughter. I am his man. Whatever affirmations the Lord speaks to you about, just repeat those back and watch what happens in your heart and your mind over the next several weeks as you begin to affirm truth instead of holding on to that stinking thinking and those old lies that other people and the enemy has whispered to you your whole life. You begin to see who you really are in Christ. Folks, when you begin to see and know and believe who you really are in him, a new person, the person he's made you to be, you will want to share that with people that you care about. You'll want to go out and tell somebody. Imagine what would happen if we all do that. I don't know if you've ever tried to lose weight. I've tried about a dozen times. I'm, I, you know, I was talking today that I could write a review book on all the different kind of diets. You know, which one are you doing? Okay, here's, here's your obstacles. Here's the way it's going to work. I mean, you know, because I've done them all. Um, and, and, and as, you, as you, you do those, you talk about it. But you know what you love to hear? What do you love to hear? You love to hear when you've lost two pounds for somebody to notice it. Hey, Dad, what? have you lost weight? Well, yeah, I have. Lost two pounds. You look good. 
Yeah, I'm kind. You don't think I'm too skinny? No, no, I didn't keep going. You know, you want to talk about it. This is the same thing in your spirit, okay? That same thing when somebody says, you've been working out? Because they see this outside you that's, that's changed, that's being transformed. Listen, your spirit is transformed in him and something new, and it just begins to come out of you. And people will see and sense and feel the same thing spiritually that we see in other people physically or emotionally. Well, you're awfully chipper today. Or oh, don't get in your hearse, he's in a bad mood. You know how we just broadcast where we are emotionally. He said, we kind of get all that in those realms, but spiritually, uh, we remain invisible. Imagine what would happen if we just began to talk about that spiritually. So here's where we are. My expectations of myself as well as you. Do you have those little cards? Um, I came in so quick. If you have one, just kind of wave it at me and see if, if a lot of us have those. If not... We've printed some extras, and you can have them. Looks like most of us do. Um, I'm going I'm to just call you out to action, okay? And this is the most, I don't know of a time when I've just kind of pushed your buttons and oh, don't make us do this. Yeah, I'm kind of making you do it, but you'll, you'll thank me, and somebody else will thank me one day. So I want you right now, just in the quietness of this moment, we're going to sing together uh, in, in just a minute I want you to think about maybe if Holy Spirit has not given you a name yet uh, you just don't have anybody just keep that in your Bible just hold on to it today but if you've got a name you've already got a name like I say I got a name I got a name I got a name I got three names um, that I know I know these, they're all three guys, they're all three different ages, they're all from three different generations, and the Lord has specifically put those names on my heart. I'm praying for them, and I'm engaging them in conversations, I'm looking for ways to minister and to love them. And I find that one of the best ways is when I just ask somebody, hey, what can I be praying for you about? You know, when somebody says, oh, I'm having a terrible day, or oh, this didn't go good, oh, I'm facing this thing at my job or I had I went through this crisis or, you know th these little things you know they come you, it, this is so easy to say hey do you care if I if I start praying for you about that Go, tell me how to pray for you tell me what I can be praying for you about it's very seldom I mean I've been in prisons and asked people that and hardened convicts who are in for decades go yeah would you pray for me I mean people are going to typically lean into that if they say no well that's okay you can pray for me anyway but I always get this, you know, conversation started with something like that. So do you have a name? You're thinking about it? I'm giving you some, just a minute. So on the bottom of that card, you see where it tears off? At the top, you're going to write your name. And if you want to write their name, you can. But just write your name. Just keep that. There's little, you know, some scriptures you can pray for people. There's scriptures you can think about and just read to kind of help you get refueled. Tear that bottom piece off now I want you to write just the first name of somebody and if you need a code name because you're afraid we're going to figure it out or anything we're not going to look at these now, or anything like that just write a first name I've written three first names on three of these cards write the first name on that card tear it off and just hold it for a second and here's what we're going to do as we sing together and you've written a person's name and his or her name is on that the bottom half of that little bookmark that you tore off. What we're going to do is this. We're just going to bring them up here on this wooden section, just all across this front. You're just going to leave that name right here. Just leave that name right here. Say a prayer over it, and then just leave it. We're not going to bother them. We're not going to clean this up for the next few weeks. We're going to leave these here so that we can keep praying over them. And every time we step into this room over the next three, three we're, we're going to see, we're going to see these cards and these names that each one of those represents a person and a life. That's going to be a reminder. We're just going to pray over them week after week. We're going to pray for these people with you. I'm going to come in here. 
other pastors will come in here. You're free to come in here anytime during the week and just pray over these names. These people to come to know Jesus, fall in love with him, and to know how much he loves and cares for them. Let's stand. Let's do this together. Let's just begin today with prayer over specific people right now in Jesus' name.